Thank you so much. I'm glad that you're here. We'll all stand and let's pray together. Oh, sweet name of Jesus. I'd like to honor you and praise you, Lord. We're giving you our hearts today. All the joys and all the things. Thank you for giving us the light in a world that's dark, filled with darkness. Father, I'm praying for every family, Lord, that, that are here today, whatever they carry and bring. Allow us to worship you in truth and spirit. And I'm praying for all the families that are out today, Lord. You bless them as well, Lord Jesus and to reach beyond. We praise you and, and declare your name in Jesus' name. We pray, amen. Me. 
You are the hope to the hopeless and broken. You are the only truth in the way. You know what blesses my heart? To hear everybody worshiping this morning. Praise God. Hallelujah.
heaven's mercy see Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. With all creation I sing praise to the King of Kings. You are my everything and I will adore you. and rainbows of living color flashes of lightning rolls of thunder blessing and honor strength and glory and power be to you the only wise king holy holy With all creation I sing praise to the King of Kings. Yes, you are my everything, and I will adore you. Adore you. Oh, we magnify your name, O Lord. We adore you. Struck wonder at the mention of your name. Jesus, your name is power, breath of living water, such a marvelous mystery. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God. Praise to the King of Kings. You are my everything, and I will adore you. You give life. You give life. You 
are love You bring light to the darkness You give hope You restore Every heart that is broken Great
your praise Our hearts will cry These bones will sing
bring suffering Lord I will remember when Calvary has fought for me both now and forever God you're so Let's sing it together. You're so good. Declare his goodness. Oh God, you're so good. You're so good to me. God, you're so good. Oh God, you're so good. Hallelujah. Oh God. Before you announce that you don't have any announcements, although you do have some announcements, you may be seated. You can still <laughs> sit down. Paul Blodgett has actually talked me into taking an offering today, but here's the thing: don't touch the plate, okay? <laughs> Let the ushers handle the plates. Right, you got it. You got your ushers, Paul. You good? All right. They're gonna. Well, Nathan's giving the announcements. They're gonna pass the plate, but don't touch the plate. Don't let me catch you touching the plate. I will come down off this pulpit if you guys touch the plate. So help me. I will yes. turn this church around, and we will go right back. I'm kidding. But um, so, Paul, if you want to gather the ushers, and we will take up an offering. Um, as it happens, we do still have bills, even when, um, you know, I'm. <laughs> Someone said, I've actually been busier during the shutdown than I was before. This microphone stand is really getting to me. Um, 
And I'm not good at taking up offerings. I've never been good at that, June, right? I've never been the offering guy. So, Because you know why, right? Because give is under the Lord, right? Give because it's in your heart. Don't give because I talked you into it. Don't give because some guy with a mask put a plate in front of your face, right? Give because your heart says, I want to give something back to the Lord for all that he's done to me. Give it as a love offering, as an act of worship, in as much as singing or anything else is an act of worship. Giving unto the Lord is an act of worship. Do it for him. Amen. So with that, Nathan, you want to pray over the offering since you're... Father, we thank you so much for this time. Father, I pray that we would worship you not only in, in, in through song, but also through our giving. Father, I thank you so much that we get a chance and an opportunity to bless you and your kingdom, Father. I pray that you would multiply what we put in. Even if it's little, Father, I pray that you would multiply it and expand in your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen. Well, first off, good morning, Belvedere First. How's everyone? Uh, it sounded all right. I heard you guys singing louder with the whole thing, but it's good. It's good. You're supposed to be singing. God is good. You know, I guess you're okay, right? But uh, so here's the thing, guys. Uh, I don't have a lot of announcements, but I have one quick thing. Actually, actually, take that back. I, for, I just realized we... We have two announcements, I just realized. One, on August, I know what you're thinking. Are we going to do a river baptism? Yes, we are. We're going to do a social different distance river baptism. Baptism. This is your chance to, it's a public declaration of what Jesus is doing in your life and the fact that you are marking, you're going under the water and coming up a new person and you are going to move forward with your walk with the Lord and forever change in that moment. So if that's something you're interested in, it is highly, highly recommended that you come and talk to Pastor David or I and just talk to us about it and we will get you signed up because it's going to be pretty awesome. It's still going to be social distance. Uh, kind of. I don't think we're going to social distance in the river, but for you guys hanging out and the watching it, you guys are social distance. But hey, there's a river, so Corona is in the river and it's flowing down, right? So, you know, hey, so we're going to be as safe as possible. You know, maybe if you want us to wear a mask, maybe we'll wear a mask. I don't even know. But here's the thing, guys. So make sure you sign up to that. It's going to be very important that you do. And also, it's going to just be an awesome day. And we'll just pray for sun. We'll get you details on that, when it's going to be and what service is going to be. It'll be towards the end of the month of August. So, yes, yeah, just stay in tune about that. Second off, that if you don't know if you guys have heard, we have completely relaunched our small groups uh, last week with a new small group curriculum through Right Now Media. But I have something very important I want to tell you guys. If you don't know what Right Now Media it is, a is a like a big company that has put out all this curriculum through small groups or maybe videos or podcasts and all this stuff. And it's thousands upon thousands of resources that we have access to. But here's the thing, though. We have floated the bill as a church, and we are giving it to you access for free. Oh my gosh, gasp. Everyone seems so excited about that. But no, but that actually is extremely important because what you can do now is now you don't have to wait just to small groups. You can do a small group with your family or you can do a small group by yourself. Maybe you're struggling with something that you really want to have overcome or maybe you just want to grow more in the Lord. There's so many resources on that thing that you can watch videos through different pastors and preachers or different, like I said, podcasts and you can just go ahead and go through those things. It's a great resource that is 100% free. Even if you don't ever think you're going to use it, come and get the information for us and we'll give it to you because at least at the end of the day, you'll have access to maybe a year from now. You're like, wait, I don't know about this. I'm trying to reach this person. How do I figure out how to reach this person? This resource will help you gear you and give the tools that it takes to reach that person. You may not know how to. So it's extremely important. Even if, like I said, you don't use it, come and grab the information and get it because it's free. Why not? Right? So come and see pastor David and I we will get your emails and all the information afterwards and we'll send you a login and it's going to be awesome. But that is all the announcements I have for the day. So as always be real, be loved. Did everybody say it with me? Be one. How many of you guys have ever been watching Netflix and you're like, oh my gosh, there's nothing on Netflix? Right? Thank you, Dylan. <laughs> Dylan, you're my man. You're my man. Um, right now, media, uh, if, in case you're kind of wondering what exactly it is, it's an app. It's an app for your phone, but it's also for smart, uh, any, kind of, any kind of internet connected device. But it's basically just teaching series and different kind of lessons and stuff from all kinds of teachers all across the spectrum. So there's like all kinds of devotionals on social issues, on all kinds of things on there. So if you get to that point, and you're like, oh my gosh, I've watched literally everything on Netflix or more likely for me, I'm like, oh, this looks like a cool show. Oh, rated MA. Oh, well, this might be a cool show. Oh, rated MA. And then Kristen's like, you can't watch that. And I'm like, I know, I know. Um, she's my, she's my, she's my accountability partner. 
This is actually good, clean stuff. There is stuff on there for kids as well. If you just give us your email address, we'll send it to you. No, we're not going to sell your email address to anybody. I don't know. If, I don't think they do either. We don't. I don't. Yeah. Um, I would just tell you. I'd be like, hey. Um, but it is really cool. So get a hold of that. Go ahead and head over in your Bibles. Bibles or your phone apps, whatever you've got with your Bible on it. We're from the South Carolina. We say Bible. We change the oil in our car and it takes about an hour to do, right? Um, every time I hear somebody up here say oil, it just, it tickles me. Oil. I don't, I, we never had that word, Wayne. Head over to John chapter four. We're going to get there in just a second. But first, let me say congratulations on being here this morning um, on which I'm now going to call vacation Sunday because everybody showed up last week. So everybody went on vacation this week. It's a balance that we have to keep around here. Um, I know Josh was probably just watching us online thinking, oh, my gosh, he's holding his guitar so high um, because we always joke that my strap is higher than his. I like to be able to reach my guitar. I don't have his long monkey arms, whatever he's got. He's got an extra tail or something comes around, plays an extra note. It's queer. It's weird. Um, but we're all on our journey back to a place called normal. How many feel like maybe life's getting at least a little more normal, like not quite as not normal? Um, it is still, it's still pretty crazy, right? Um, but we're trying to get back to normal. The thing about it is, of course, with normal is that normal is very relative. Um, and people keep talking about the new normal. And I don't know what they mean by that. I feel like maybe they don't have an idea either. I think they just like that phrase. It sounds cool. On t the new normal. Um, I've got, okay. I, I'm trying not to let the word face mask come out of my mouth today. All right. We, uh, we were joking about that on our board. I have three people on my board. One is we should always wear masks. One is we should never wear masks. And one is I'm going to wear a mask and I don't care if you do or not. So I have a pretty balanced board, right? Because they're, they're on all sides of that. And in our church, we have the same thing. And we want to be careful with those sorts of things and definitely be respectful of other people. Um, I'm going to kind of get into that. It's so easy to divide over things anymore that as soon as somebody has an opinion that's different than ours, we want to make teams out of it. We want to give them a red shirt and we wear a blue shirt and then we hit them with a paintball gun. Um, I don't think that's how God wants it in his kingdom. So I had a routine and a rhythm kind of before all of this COVID stuff happened. I kind of knew what was going to happen each day of the week or had a broad idea. Monday would be my day off. I'd probably go play a little pickleball in the morning and go have lunch with Kristen. And then, you know, that's what I said. I'd be all stinky from pickleball. And she'd be like, stay away. And be like, Give me a hug. And she'd be like, no, get away. Right. It's a game we play, you know, when you're married. Right. Um, no one. And then on Tuesday, I'd have like lunch with a pastor or something like that. It'd be kind of my, kind of my get office work done day. And then Wednesday was, you know, our small groups and we'd have a podcast, me and Nathan. And then Thursday was pantry. And Friday was, you know, like a do kind of like a half day. And about the time the get hooked crowd comes in, I would go out and have, you know, just on my back porch, I'd have my office back there. And, and it was, and then Saturday was a study day and then Sunday was Sunday and everything kind of had a rhythm. And then COVID hits and all of a sudden I don't have a rhythm anymore, right? Like this day, all of a sudden weird things have to happen this day and this day you can't do anything here. And this day something new has, and it's just, you know, also we were doing devotionals like every day we were doing praise and worship music all the time. We kept a really big schedule because we wanted to keep everybody connected because everybody was kind of shut out. So here's what kind of happened. Normal, a normal day is when you find your car keys, the car starts, you show up for work, you do your job, you go home, you have some dinner, spend some time with your family, scroll through your phone and go to bed, right? Pretty normal day for every, that sounds about, sounds about right for like most of us. I'd say that's kind of the day, right? But then there are days when your keys go missing, your car makes a sound you've never heard before, the company you work for goes under, you come home and your spouse is too busy with their own worries to take care of you, which is just wrong, right? I mean, come on. I'm home now. Take care of me. Um, and then you scroll on your phone and go to bed. So... <laughs> What we've had now is there are days where you don't bother going to your car because every store is in lockdown. You can't go out to eat anywhere. The company you work for says you're non essential. You've been locked up with the same family for two months and you're all on each other's nerves. So you go scroll on your phone, but it's full of injustice, protests, rioting. So you watch TV and the news is pretty sure that the world is ending. So you just go take your phone, scroll on it, and go to bed. 
that's been kind of where we've been at. Our normal has definitely changed. But I'm the kind of person that I always want to know how things got to be the way they are. Whenever I look at a system, my first thought is, well, why is this like this? I like going hiking in the woods, and I like finding signs of life, signs that someone had been there before. You find little places where they've made, you know, different sort of things in the woods. You go hiking through places, and you'll see where somebody stopped to fish, or you have a campfire here, and you can gather clues. I kind of like the door of the experience explorer feeling of it, you know, let's go, you know, swipe or no swiping, right? All those kind of things. But most of the time, we end up in a thing that we call normal that we didn't mean to be normal. I, there was a job I had once for 10 years that I should have had for five, right? <laughs> but it just got so easy to stay there, right? And, and it just got so easy to have the routine and know where I was going and what things were going to happen. And so it became normal without me meaning to be normal. The thing about it was, is I was supposed to be in ministry, but I was, I was working there because the pay was good and the work wasn't too hard. And I liked the people and we had everything we needed. So it was easy to just day after day go through the same thing. And then one day, my boss's dad had a heart attack and then his mom passed away, and he said, you know what, I'm getting out of the business, and he sold the company. He didn't even ask me, Elaine. He just sold the company. And so all of a sudden, I was out there with no normal anymore, and I had to find a job and all these things. But they did this great little thing where I was able to get into the ministry because of it. But what I've also realized is over the last 50, 30, even 20 years, because, yes, Y2K was 20 years ago. Right? I was sitting in a server room at midnight 20 years ago, December 31st, waiting to see if the world would end. Right? We were checking the news from China to see if China had fallen right? because it was already the day before there. Y2K was 20 years ago. And in, in these last years, things have become normal that weren't normal to us before. So, for instance, Kurt, me and you can remember a time where if we wanted to go out of town, we had to go to the bank and get enough money for the trip. Remember that? Because you had to figure out how much gas you were going to use, how far you were going to go, how many meals, and you had to get out actual money for that. We didn't have cars. Yeah, I, I remember even when debit cards came out and credit cards came out, and you're worried, well, if I'm driving through West Virginia, I'm going to hit some little town, and they're not going to have that. Can you imagine going someplace now, and they wouldn't take your card for gas? It's just normal, right? That they do that. But there was a time where we couldn't do that. There was times where I'm thinking, man, I got enough money for one more fill up. I hope this gets me all the way back to Louisville, right? Other things that have become normal. I had to be careful about this. I like to get carried away with this. All the things that have changed that kids nowadays don't understand. You know, there was a point at which I really liked a song that was on an eight track that my dad had. And the song, if you guys remember, the song is called Don't Walk Away, Renee. Anybody remember that song? Right? That song was on an eight track. It was on the third track, right, right after Running Bear Loves Little White Dove and right before Like a Rhinestone Cowboy. And for 20 years, I could not find that song. Like, I would go into record shops. I would go into, because you went to malls back then. Malls were these big stores with other little stores inside of them, um, right? And you would go there, and they'd have the record shop, and I would look for that song. And, and I always remember, it's like a memory in my head somewhere off in the distance. Don't walk away, Renee, right? Like, and I remember the song, and I would sing the song, but I couldn't find the song because it just didn't exist anywhere. And nowadays, you can find any song anywhere, anytime. We just take that for granted that if you like a song, you're going to be able to go on YouTube and, and play that song or on your phone, on, on Amazon Music or I, iTunes, right? We didn't have that though, right? You could actually have a song in your head and have no way of hearing that song. We used to, we used to have tape recorders and it would, the song would come on the radio and we'd hit record and you hated it when the DJ would sit there and talk over the intro. You're like, shut up, I'm recording the song. And then what happens is you memorize what the DJ says before the intro because it's recorded on your mixtape, right? Thank you, Jamie, you're with me there. Chris, you're with me, right? We were all back there in those days. We used to have to ask people for directions to places and rely on their crazy advice. Someone once told me, you turn left the road where the blue barn used to be. 
<laughs> How do I know where the blue barn used to be? Now I just ask Google. Google, I need to go here. It's very normal for me to say, where is it at? They just give me the name of a place, and I walk out the door expecting to find that place. I was there when GPS was new, and it took me down this road, and it was the wrong road, and the road became gravel. And I was like, this road shouldn't be gravel. I shouldn't be on a gravel road in the middle of nowhere. And I had to drive to the nearest hill to get cell service to try and call somebody to get directions back. Right? But now it's just normal to get in our cars. And these aren't things we ever intended. We didn't say, hey, you know what? Let's make a world in which no one ever has to buy a map again. In fact, I'm guessing Rand McNally didn't expect this to hit them, right? Just like the record companies didn't expect the change. And all of a sudden, normal shifts in ways that we didn't intend for it to. Well, of course, that brings me back to church. Because not only in our society have a lot of good things happened, and a lot of good things are now normal that didn't used to be normal, but a lot of bad things have become normal too. Division has become normal. It has become normal to say, if you disagree with me politically, I'm going to, you know, just let you have it. You know, I'd never have these conversations in person that I see people typing on Facebook, right? Like, like people are mean on Facebook, and then you talk to them, like, oh, hey, how's it going, right? Because they just sound mean out there. But it's very normal for you to be scrolling down through something, see something you don't like, and give that person what for, because you're going to fix them. It's just normal, right? We just do that, Right? That of all the good things that have become normal, we've had a lot of things creep into our culture that we now consider normal and no longer do anything about because it's just the way things are. A lot of times the world begins to take a negative turn and we see something bad introduced into the culture and we just go ahead and accept it as normal and it becomes a thing. I mean, that, like when I'm talking about Netflix, right? Like every new show now, I'm like, I probably can't watch it. If it's a new show, we're watching Tool Time on one of the channels because we're like, you know, at least we know it's going to be clean and there's not going to be anything bad on it, right? Because it's, it's Tool Time. Home Improvement. I think it's Tool Time's a show in the Okay. But we accept it as normal that the media is going to get worse and worse. We accept it as normal that the news is going to be more and more bombastic, more and more depressing. We expect the world to fall apart. That's almost normal to us. That injustice has become normal. Pride, vulgarity, cynicism, all of these things are just normal. It's just the way things are. And so what I like about coronavirus, that's a good way to start a message, right? What I like about coronavirus is that it reset our normal. It gave us a chance to break out of that habit, to change where we were at, to make the jump and do something different, to get out of that rut. The old preacher used to say that a rut is just a grave with the ends knocked out, right? As he just said, it's just a, it's just a grave with the ends knocked out. I, I thought it was hilarious. He, he had a lot of those. He was an old country guy. He'd say, you know, you're staring like an old cow looking at a new gate, you know, right? That was one of the, that's how I'm kind of feeling right now, actually. Um, But here's what it says in 2 Timothy. We're going to get to John in a second. But in 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 7, it says, But know this, hard times will come in the last days, for people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, proud, demeaning, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, without love for what is good, traitors, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, holding on to a form of godliness but denying its power, Avoid these people, for among them are those who worm their way into households and deceive gullible women, overwhelmed by sin and led astray by a, very, by a variety of passions, always learning and never able to come to a knowledge of the truth. Now, let me ask you, does that sound like, where's my water at? That's not mine, right? You know, I'm going to drink this one. This is my one from practice that I never took back. You guys are okay with that, right? I hope so, or I'll cough the whole way through this. So here's the thing. When I go over this list, I'm going to go over this list again. We know this list is in the world. People are lovers of self. Oh my gosh, selfie generation, right? Um, lovers of money, boastful, proud. Everybody's got to show you. You know, I got to show Darren my new shoes, right? Darren's got to show me his newer, more expensive shoes. And Nathan, actually, those are like even newer, even more expensive shoes you're wearing today, right? I can't keep up in the shoe game. I just go for color and matching because these guys are playing at a different level than me. That's okay. I'm not saying that you're boastful. I'm not putting you in this verse, but well, kind of, I guess. Um, <laughs> 
demeaning, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable. They don't want to bring back together slanderers without self-control, brutal, without love for what is good, traitors, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, holding on to the form of godliness but denying its power. That really does sound like a horrible world to live in. The problem is, is that he's not preaching this to the world. This is a pastor, Paul, speaking to one of his under pastors, Timothy, about what's in the church. And I always grew up with that idea of, yeah, the world is like that, but it's not the world that's like that anymore. That you can go into churches and find people who are lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, proud, demeaning, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, slanderers without self-control, brutal, having a form of godliness but denying its power. That that's in the church now and that we kind of expect it. That there are people who walk into churches and have the expectation of rejection in a church. We had a conversation this week. We were, we were playing with some friends and uh, I said something. I said, you know, you got to come to my church sometime or something. I was just kind of half joking with them. And he goes, oh, if I came to the church, the place would burn down. And I'm like, don't worry about it. Worse than you has been in our church. You know, I'm thinking, hey, worse than you's taking up our offering. Worse than you sang up in the choir. Worse than you's preached from the pulpit. Let me tell you something. There are worse sinners than you out there, and we've been saved and redeemed and put in a place where God can use us. Trust me, the church isn't going to burn down because you've been in there, because worse than you's already been here. Amen? How many of you are worse than a few people before God got a hold of you, right? I was worse than at least three people, and maybe four people were worse than me when I came to know the Lord, Right? But what the church calls normal has changed. But normal changes in times like these. I like to say this. I said this this morning. And I have to. So there should be a different normal for the sheep and the goats, right? Well, keep in mind, when Jesus gives the illustration of separating the sheep and the goats, he's not talking about lost and saved. He's not talking about pagans, you guys over here, and Christians, you guys over here. Because what does he say? Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name? Didn't we speak, you know, didn't we, you know, cast, you know, didn't we do all these different acts and miracles in your name? And then he went over the list of things that they didn't do, right? That he went over the works that they had that were evil. He wasn't dividing, you know, lost from saved. He was dividing people who thought they were in the kingdom from people that really were in the kingdom. We get it out of our head that the Bible says that it's actually a narrow way to the kingdom of God and it's a wide way to destruction, and one of the key differences, I just Googled this. I just got like, what, you know, what are, what are sheep and goats different at? What's the big difference between a sheep and a goat other than they look, goats look ugly. I'm sorry. Like when they're little baby goats, they're kind of cute. You know, every baby, I don't know if you know this, like even little Darren and Alanda's baby, they're naturally cuter so that you'll be attracted to them, right? Um, it's just, and there he is back there. Hey, buddy. Hey, Casey. Um, but the real difference between sheep and goats is that sheep are all about the herd and goats act as individuals. The goats don't need other goats. Goats will walk around by themselves. You could put a goat out in the yard and he'll just eat and be happy and doesn't need anybody else. Sheep have to have a herd. Sheep have to be in a body. Sheep have to be a part of something. Goats are okay outside of that. All the time now, especially now, people are like, oh yeah, I'm a Christian. I'm saved. I, I'm with the Lord. I just don't want to be in a church. I don't want to be, you know, I don't, it, 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 organ, like, like you like your religion disorganized, not organized. I love that one. I don't like organized religion. Well, how disorganized do you, for you need to be? Because on some days, I'm pretty sure we could pass muster on your, on your disorganization test, just ask Cheryl or, or Debbie or um, uh, Pat or anybody that has to deal with my organizational skills. We're not an organized religion here um, by most standards, right? But really, amen, thank you, Paul. But really, but really the problem is, is they're not a sheep, they're a goat. They're out for themselves. They're lovers of self. Their interest is in themselves. What they want is what's right for me. What works for me? What can this do for me? They're not about being in a body and helping anyone else out or doing anything for anybody else. It all comes back to how does this, you know, pastor, I'm not being fed. It's not my job to feed you. 
It's my job to preach the word to you. You know, I, it's, listen, you can put your food out in front of your kids. How many of you sat in front of a cold plate of broccoli for a long time as a kid or a cold plate of spinach or Brussels sprouts? I remember. And the thing is, you're saying in your mind, if you just eat it, you can get out of here. And I can't, I couldn't bring myself to eat it, right? Because it didn't matter what they put in front of you. When I was a kid, what they put in front of you, you were going to eat eventually. And then my dad would tell me stories. Well, when I was in the Navy, we used to have to eat bugs and everything else because there'd be like bugs in his food and they'd, they'd just eat it back then when they were going to school uphill both ways, right? <laughs> but a lot of people will say a church isn't meeting my needs because they're not about the church. They're about them and my needs and my things getting filled. And our society, it is normal now for you to want others to do for you. Whether or not you do for them, we actually expect people to go ahead and meet our needs regardless of what we decide to do for anyone else. So let's actually get to the story since we're, you know, five minutes into this. We'll say five. John chapter four is probably not where you thought I was going to go with this, but we're going to go to the woman at the well. And this is why we'll start verse one through six as you're heading over to John four. If you've already got there, read with me on your phones, on your Bibles, whatever you got. When Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that he was making and baptizing more disciples than John, though Jesus himself was not baptizing, but his disciples were, he left Judea and went again to Galilee. He had to travel through Samaria. So he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar and he near, pro near property that Jacob Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there. Jesus, worn out from his journey, sat down at the well. It was about noon. So one, um, just any of you guys that have been following along in Isaiah um, during the week, when the Assyrians come down and wipe out the northern tribe of Israel and Judah is still down there safe for several years after that, Assyria actually deports the 10 tribes of Israel to other places and then imports other people. And the Bible says that the people that are imported also worshiped Yahweh, but they also worshiped other gods and just kind of mixed everybody in there. But we know from history that they were already kind of doing that, that Ahab was already kind of like, I like Baal and I like Yahweh. So they were already mixed in their worship of Yahweh. They had altars at Bethel and Dan and all of these things. If you've been here in the last year or so, we've been going over a lot of this. But basically, these people, when they were imported, became kind of the, the half-breeds. So the Jews were very racist towards the Samaritans because they weren't true Jews like them. They were mixed with other things. They didn't worship Yahweh correctly. They had altars at, ba at Dan and Bethel, and they didn't worship God the same way they worshiped. And so they generally avoided them whenever they could. I kind of have this feeling like maybe Jesus is cutting through Samaria because the Jews were on his nerves and he was kind of trying to go somewhere they wouldn't. Right? Like, like you know, if, if, a, if, if you were being bothered by somebody of the opposite sex, so you go in your bath, you know, you go in the guy's bathroom so, you know, your wife can't follow you. Ha, I'm in here where I'm safe. Right? Um, then just wait outside the door. But I, I kind of feel, I kind of feel like Jesus is like that. He's kind of like, you know what? I'm, I'm out of here. And he's, and he's going through Samaria, but it's about noon and he stops down at a well. Now, how many of you go out and mow your grass at about two in the afternoon? Like, you're like, you know what? It's eight o'clock in the morning and you're up, but let's go ahead and wait till the sun gets, you know, right overhead, hottest part of the day. That'd be a great day to go mow the grass. How many guys do we do that? Right? No, you don't do that. You wait till it's either morning or evening, or you hope that it rains so you can tell your wife it's raining and I can't mow the grass, or it rained earlier and the grass is still wet, or find some reason why you don't have to mow the grass and it can go one of the, any kind of thing that could happen, you know, that you don't have to mow it. But basically you wait till it's the right temperature, but it's the middle of the day and a woman comes walking to the well where Jesus is at. Now, why does a woman come walking to the well in the middle of the day? If you're going to carry water, when are you going to carry water? You're going to carry it in the morning and the evening. Not only that, it's going to be a community type thing. Everybody's got to go down and get water, right? So we would all in the morning go gather, our, gather, you know, get your pitchers or whatever. You'd go down to the well and you'd all sit there and talk about what's going on in town and who's done what. And you'd sit around the well and talk. So why do you suppose this girl is coming around noon? Because she doesn't want to be around the other people in the town because she's got a history and she's got a past and there's a reason why she doesn't want to be there when everybody else gathers. So she waited till noon, but as it happens, Jesus was waiting there for her. And so the story goes, the verse seven, a woman of Samaria came to draw water. 
Give me a drink, Jesus said to her, because his disciples had gone into town to buy food. How is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? She asked, for Jews do not associate with Samaritans. So, okay, one, she's a woman, and they don't, you know, usually guys and girls back then, it was a little different. They didn't have tender or anything like that. You wouldn't just meet a strange girl at the well. That's not something you would do. It's a different cultural type thing. But two, she was a Samaritan, so she expected him to reject her on two different levels. Because keep in mind, she's already coming at noon, understanding that she's the kind of person that other people are going to mock and reject, and she's avoiding them. And she probably wasn't happy to see a guy there. And she was probably hoping he wouldn't say anything. You ever been in Walmart and there's somebody you haven't seen for a while and you like them, but you're just really in a hurry. So you don't want to stop and talk to them. So you're trying to like not make eye contact or you're trying to figure out where they're going to the grocery store. So you're like, okay, I'm going to go down this aisle right here. I'm not allowed to go in Walmart with my wife because I will talk to everybody and she will get mad and eventually strangle me. And I'll wake up in the trunk of the car as she's taking me home. Right. It's just, and I don't blame her because I will talk for a long time in Walmart. But she was probably trying even to avoid him, and he stops and he says, hey, can I get a drink? Can you give me some water? And she's like, why are you even talking to me? She expected him to reject her. She was used to people rejecting her. She was familiar with people rejecting her. In fact, it was normal for her to be rejected by people when she was at the well. And Jesus gave her a command. Could you give me some water? And she gave Jesus an excuse right? Can you go mow the lawn? Well, it's, it rained last week and it's probably still wet, right? You know, it, she, it, Jesus has given her a command and she's giving Jesus an excuse. So many times the Lord speaks to our heart. He tells us something. Hey, you should go talk to so-and-so. Hey, you should call this person. Hey, you see that person sitting by themselves. You should go sit by them and have a conversation with them. And we give Jesus a reason why we can't right? A lot of times it's not that we don't hear the voice of God or know what God is saying. It's that we're finding all kinds of reasons why if it was really you, God, then could you spell out your name in the clouds with an arrow pointing at the person you want me to talk to? If you really want me to give them $20, could you like actually make it fall out of my wallet into their hands as I walk by them? If you really wanted me to help them get their car fixed, could you, you know what I'm saying? And we give God all these qualifications to do what we already know we should do but we're finding a reason not to do it. And so Jesus gives her a command and she gives him as an excuse. Here's the thing. Normal church is church where everyone has a job. Church is not a spectator sport, right? It's not a big arena full of people watching a few people perform. That normal church should be a church at which when you are gone, you are missed because there are things that you do in the church that without you do not get done. And I know that's weird coming out of this because we got stripped down to how many people exactly does it take to do a thing in our church? Kristen's like, I can only have this many pantry volunteers and we've got to feed like the entire nation, right? And we got like 10 people. And so she puts in Elaine and Jamie and Tara because they're monsters at making boxes. Um, just, I know I, I feel bad around Jamie cause she outworks me. And that makes me, that makes me feel bad. Um, <laughs> I'm trying to compliment you from the, I know it's a thing. Normal church is a place where everybody has a job. We don't treat church like that. We treat church very much like a like a luxury item, like a commodity, like a, hey, church is there for me when I need something or when I want to go and, and people there will do things for me or I'll get certain things out of it. Or if I go up there, I'll get filled and things like that. We even make the worship service about us. We only think a worship service is a good worship service. If we feel good about the worship service, we never get at the end of a worship service and say, man, God was glorified. Most of the time what I hear about worship is, man, I really felt that. That really touched me. That really spoke to me. We make worship a lot about us, don't we? We, we really do kind of center that thing around us and not glorifying God or giving glory to God or raising the name of God. We make worship about whether or not I like the song and how did the song make me feel? I have that, you know, I'm up here playing sometimes and I'm like, oh Lord, I'm not feeling this song. And I can almost hear the Holy Spirit say, I don't care, <laughs> right? You praise anyway. 
right? That's what a sacrifice of praise is. A sacrifice isn't giving something you have a bunch of. A sacrifice is when you come to the place where you don't feel like praising God because your husband or your wife was mean to you and your kids aren't listening to you and the cars broke down and there's nothing going on and you just want to turn your eyes to heaven and say, but thank you, God, that you saved me and you cleansed me and you brought me back. You know what, God? There's a lot going wrong, but you're still a good God and I'm going to stand here and I'm going to praise you until I see the reality of the faith in my heart come to fruition in front of my eyes that I believe that you're going to bring this to pass and I'm going to praise you now. Instead of making it about me and how I feel and man, right? We, we, uh, let me get through some of this. Normal church is a place where everybody has a job. Next. Jesus answered in verse 10, if you knew the gift of God who is saying to you, give me a drink, you would ask him and he would give you living water. Sir, the woman said, you don't even have a bucket and the well is deep. So where do you get this living water? You aren't, you are, you aren't greater than our father Jacob, are you? He gave us the well to, and drank from it himself as did his sons and livestock. She was used to well water, and Jesus is offering living water. How many of you ever lived on a farm with well water? Well water tastes different than spring water, doesn't it? <laughs> Flowing water tastes different than water that sits in a well. If you, you know, like leave a cup out on the counter for a few days, and it tastes different than the water that comes out of the tap, right? That she's used to stagnant water, and Jesus is offering her living water, and she doesn't know what to do with that because, one, she's like, are you just going to make like a stream appear? What's going to go on here? Because she thinks he's talking about physical water. And she's so used to the stagnant things that she's already known that when he offers her something new, she doesn't know what to make of it. But church should be a place of living water, not of stagnant water. And I, and I said this before in the earlier service, and I believe this. Sometimes I get too programmed in my head. We need to do this many songs. And Elaine knows I do this too. When we practice a song, I have to know how many times we do the verse and the chorus, and then how many times we do the bridge and stuff like that. And she will change it on me. And I'm like, I'm trying to, you know, I'm trying to catch up because I, you know, I, I program my brain for that, right? And, and I have to intentionally stop sometimes. And say, okay, is the Holy Spirit moving here and I'm missing it because I'm so busy trying to watch the notes or listen to the music or do the thing? Right? That we have to make that room for him because the Holy Spirit is a moving, living water. Now, this is funny because in a minute I'm going to contradict a little bit of that just slightly, but you'll get to it. Normal church pours into you, or normal church is a place of living water, not stagnation. Verse 13 through 15. Jesus says, everyone who drinks from this water will get thirsty again, but whoever drinks from the water that I will give will never get thirsty again. In fact, the water I give him will become a well of water springing up in him for eternal life. Sir, the woman said, give me this water so I won't get thirsty and I won't and draw and come here to draw water. Sir, the woman said, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and come here to draw water. And I'm kind of stressing that second part. That if you have something, Jesus, that I don't have to come back to this place of shame over and over again. If you have some sort of grace or forgiveness for somebody like me, that I don't have to come back to the place where people make fun of me. I don't have to come back to the place where I'm bullied. I don't have to come back to the place where people point out my faults. I don't have to come back to the place where everything looks, what, looks at me and says, what's going wrong in my life? If you have something like that, Jesus, I'll take that. Because I don't want to keep coming back here. Oh, and church should be a place. Church should be a place that when people come with what's going on in their lives, they expect to be accepted, not rejected. That when someone walks into the door of the church and they're struggling with whatever they're struggling with, that they don't have to hide it from their brothers and sisters in Christ for fear of being ostracized but can put their heart out there and say, this is where I'm struggling. This is what I'm suffering with. This is what I've had to go through. This is the place I'm at in life. There are things that hurt and that we wouldn't get rejected for that, but we get accepted for that. In fact, we get loved for it because guess what? Every single one of you has been through stuff that you wouldn't want me to put on the screen behind me, right? And so we know, and yet... We're so programmed in our mind that we walk into church that everybody else is so perfect and doesn't have anything going on and their lives are great and everything is fine with them. And it's not that way. We've been through some mess this week. Amen? 
How many of you just no struggles this week? This week's been just perfect. It's been like a glide. Like, like since last Sunday, man, just not a, not a speed bump, not a hiccup. I've just been full speed downhill all the way, never had to struggle with anything, right? We've all been through stuff this week. Especially with what's going on, church should be a place where you expect to be accepted, where it is normal for you to be able to confess. Because the Bible literally says to confess your faults one to another, and we usually chicken out of that and say, as long as I confess it to God, I'm fine. The reason why the Bible says to confess to one another is because somebody needs to be involved in your struggle with you, because if you're in the struggle by yourself, you will fail. That's what accountability is about. That's what strengthening each other is about. That if you're in the battle by yourself, it's only going to be a matter of time and you're going to mess up again. And even if you do mess up, have people in your life that pick you up, right? I, I nag Kristen until she encourages me sometime. I, 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 I'm bad about this because there's this thing, you know, you, you, get, you get out of people what you pour into them. But sometimes I really want her to encourage me. So I'll bug her about it until she does. That is not the best way to get an encouragement. And sometimes I hear myself doing it in my head. But I'm like, no, but I really want you to encourage me. And she, it's almost like, why wouldn't you just start with, hey, encourage me, versus what I actually do, which is complain about everything around me so she sees how miserable I am so that she can then be like, oh, you need encouragement. That's why you're that. No, right? We do that, don't we? We just sit there and fuss and grouse and kick the dog and everything else trying to get the person in our life to notice that we're struggling, right? We do things in church. You know, people actually act out in church trying to let someone in church know, hey, I'm struggling with something and they're too afraid to say what it is or they're too afraid to open up to anybody and let them know. But church should be a place where we're by default accepted. So Jesus says, go call your husband. He told her and come back. I have, I don't have a husband. She answered, you have correctly said, I don't have a husband. Jesus said, for you've had five husbands and the man you're with now that you have is not your husband. What you have said is true. Jesus calls her out on her sin. But somehow, either the tone in his voice or the smile on his face or something about him, even when he called her out for being in sin, she didn't leave. You know, there are different ways you could tell people they're messing up. Sometimes I, I had this conversation with a pastor the other day because we said something about criticism. And I said, I, I said, I'm okay with criticism. He says, no, you're not. And I said, oh, I'm fine with criticism. I'm fine with criticism that comes from people who are going to walk the journey with me and help me get better at things. If you're walking the journey with me, if we have the same mission, if we're going the same way in life and you're like, hey, you need help in this area or you should straighten up in this area and you're going to walk with me and help me do that, I'm absolutely fine. Now, if you're going to stand on the sidelines and just throw barbs into the arena, I have no time time for that, right? I don't have time for people that want to stand on the sidelines and sit there and criticize the stuff you're doing because they're not doing anything. If you're in the battle with me and there's a better way we can win this fight, then I am all with you giving me some correction and saying, hey, this is the way we need to go. And there was something about the way Jesus corrects her that she's okay with it. And there are ways that you can talk to people and help correct them. The problem is, is half the time in church, we don't want to get in someone's life and disciple that person. We just want to tell them they're messed up so we feel better about who we are so we can go on being the Pharisees we were. Amen? Um, I knew it was a more teaching sermon than a preaching sermon, but that's just, you know, sometimes you do teaching sermons. You know, what are you do? Normal church pours into you as you pour into others. Normal church is a place where you can come and be clean and loved, not crucified. And then verse 19 and 22, and you see this all the time. This is, I love this response from her because once Jesus calls her out on her sin, you're like, well, what is she going to say next to Jesus? Jesus just called her out. By the way, you have like a huge glaring problem in your life. Just letting you know, I'm, I'm Jesus. I can heal you of that. You have this huge thing, right? So the next thing she does is debate religion. So go to the next verse. I'm just going to read it off there. Go to the next verse. Sir, the woman replied, I see that you are a prophet. She's like, okay. Our fathers worshiped at this mountain, yet you Jews say that the place to worship is in Jerusalem. Go ahead. Jesus told her, believe me, woman, the hour is coming when you will worship the father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. So she starts with arguing theology with them. What's really wrong is that in her heart, she's broken for the situation that she's in, that she's looking for affirmation in man after man and not finding it, that she hasn't built in her life the things that she wants, and she's to the place where she can only go and get the sustenance she needs when no one else is around. Imagine how many mornings she woke up thirsty but couldn't bring herself to go down to the well because the people that knew her would be there. That's the real problem. But when you talk about that, the first thing she wants to debate is, do you believe in once saved, always saved? 
Who cares? You know what? The first time I ever really had that discussion with somebody outside of outside when I was on my own was in the Navy, and I found a friend, and me and him were Christians, and we were absolutely just brothers because we were Christians. And then at one point, he's like, oh, but it just came up a conversation. Oh, I'm Baptist. I believe once saved, always saved. I was like, oh, I don't. And that was all we ever talked about it. You know why? Because we were in the Navy, and everybody else around us was drinking and running around and going to clubs, and we were actually two people following the Lord together. So we didn't care about a doctrinal issue, right, because we were brothers in the Lord. It wasn't going to divide us. But a lot of times in church, we want to go ahead and draw lines and say, if you're not the exact kind of Christian I am, then you're not a Christian at all. I, I always feel bad when somebody makes it their life goal to find out what's wrong with other churches and other denominations. Because they're on the other side saying the same thing about us. Now listen, I'm in the assemblies because I believe doctrinally everything. I don't have to apologize for any part of the Bible. I can read it out like I want to read it. But there are people in the Baptist church that believe differently than me, and I'm okay with that. I don't have to fix them, right? They're probably not going to come to my church anyway. They come here and Elaine starts singing and shouting on the stage. They'll be out anyway, right? So we don't, it's okay, you be at your church, that's all right. You're believing in God, I'm going to bless you on your journey because that's where you're at. But we want to divide and we want to hurt and we want to crucify. And it just looks bad to the world, right? When we always want to take the vinegar out of the, I don't know how you say that. <laughs> Every now and then you have these old military phrases in your head and you're trying to clean them up for the pulpit. But we want to take the fight out of other Christians and make them and prove why they're wrong. And it doesn't. It doesn't prove anything to them, and it doesn't make you look good either. Normal church is a place where you can come in and get clean and not crucified. And we in the church argue about the wrong things. We argue about hymns and carpets and masks. But in verse 23, he says, But an hour is coming and is now here when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Yes, the Father wants such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. The woman said, I know the Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. And Jesus said, I, the one speaking to you, am he. Um, Nathan and Elaine, if you guys want to come. He says that they're going to worship him in spirit and in truth. I had a conversation this week with a friend, and I, I asked a question. Uh, we said something about being a spirit-led church. And he questioned whether we were a spirit-led church. And I know what he was getting at. And this is where I said this kind of this kind of goes against what I was saying earlier, but not really. It actually fits hand in glove. Because the thing about it is, is a lot of times we in the Pentecostal denomination have gotten to the place where we feel like a spirit-led church means the pastor never preaches. It's just all music and altar call and praying and hand raising and running the aisles and hanging off the fans. And we just have that moment where God just heaven touches earth. And let me tell you something. That's why I'm here because that's that happens. Amen. I love those moments when God grabs a hold of me. I've gone down in the spirit. Hey, I had somebody go to pray for me once and I flew back and I heard my head bounce off the floor and felt nothing because the spirit was all over me and God was working on me and doing things. And I am absolutely about that 100%. But if having those experiences would change the world, then why is the church in the shape that it's in? Because I grew up in a lot of churches that had a whole lot of that. And the world out there still looked like the world out there. And they never got touched by it. And in fact, a lot of those same people that would have the great experiences that day would be in the bars that night. Let's be honest, right? A lot of them that were really having those experiences then would turn around and be abusive to their family at home. Or they'd be just, you know what I'm saying? That there's two sides to this. There's spirit and there's truth. That we need to have that spiritual experience side. We need to have a place of abandon where we're before God with our hearts open wide. And he just has full reign. And we are moving in the Holy Spirit and things are good. But we also need to have a strong foundation in the truth that we can rightly divide scripture. Because right now, in this time and in this day, the world is trying to compress us into their version of normal. And it's not a good thing. And because Christians sometimes, and let's say us, sometimes get so wrapped up and looking for the experience or the emotional experience that sometimes we don't get to that place where we truly disciple people so that in that time when people say to them, hey, this is true and this is true, and they get drug all over the place, they can't make a stand because they don't know how to rightly divide truth. Because wisdom, knowledge without wisdom is like the old farmer that heard like the Cadillacs were just the best car and everybody should have a Cadillac. 
So he goes and buys a Cadillac, cuts the top off of it, and has his horse pull it around. He got the nicest car he, had, he could get, but he's got a horse pulling it around. So what's the point? We have so many facts poured into us. We have so many statistics poured into us. We have so much knowledge poured into us. We don't even know what to do with it. And so we're like the old man hauling around his Cadillac with the horse. That if we don't have that spirit and we don't have that truth, brother and sister in Christ, let me tell you this. The most important thing you can do in your life to follow God the way you need to follow Him is to learn to listen to the Holy Spirit and stop making excuses for disobeying His voice. Every person in this room, I am convinced at some point in your life, whether you realize it or not, God has reached out to you. He has spoken to you. He has pulled on your heart. He's trying to move. Listen, God speaks to everybody in different ways. We're not talking audible voices where he's splitting the clouds, but you've heard him pull at your heart. You know when he's tried to give you a suggestion one way or the other. And what you have to the key thing in days like this, if we're going to be an effective church, we have to learn to know the move of the Holy Spirit and to follow it. We have to be people of of spirit and of truth. I, can I tell you that a lot of what the world is laying out in front of the church is a trap set by the enemy to see if we'll fall for it. To see if we'll expend our energy on a fight we don't need to be in. If he can draw us into an argument that we have no place in and then beat us with his experience. That we're seeing a whole lot of things that... Listen, as a pastor, I want to fight over some of this stuff, Jesse. I want to get mad at somebody. I want to get out there and type. I want to tell them, you don't, you can't do this, you can't do that. And the Holy Spirit just keeps saying, don't fight them. They're just looking for that fight. Be that peacemaker, that person of wisdom and truth that knows the way of the Lord in the middle of all of this. I hope we're out of time on the stream because when I say this, I just want to say this to you guys. Because I want you to know this in your heart. I want you to know this in your heart.